today on the Perception in Action podcast, my interview with Drew Dunlop, basketball coach and co-founder of the Pro Lane. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Now on to the show. Today, my guest is Drew Dunlop. Uh, thanks for joining me, Drew. I appreciate it, Rob. I'm very honored to be on, as oh. as always. Oh, so, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. And so, we're going to do is a is a bat, and we're going to talk about basketball today. So, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into coaching, and 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 what you're doing, where you're working now? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I always tell people, coaching found me. I didn't find it. <laughs> right? Like everyone grows up, you're a player. You're never thinking about, oh, you know, there's actually coaches. Like those are roles that you can you can get into. Um, so, I was a gym rat. Uh, prototypical, you know, doing all the on-air drills and and everything else, and and always wondering how come it wasn't transferring to a to the real game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that my whole life, high school, college, finished college, and just started working out some of my teammates because they asked me to because they knew I was a gym rat. I was mm-hmm. in there a lot, um, and then got lucky, applied for some internships, uh, was fortunate enough to get to to work. For Tim Grover had Attack Athletics in Chicago, uh, summer of 2010, and from there, kind of opened up the door to go to China, to go to, you know, all these different countries through through the game of basketball in, in the role of a coach and a skill development guy, mm-hmm. and trying to figure out, okay, how do I how do I help these players? How do I, you know, develop the things that I'm seeing uh, that they're struggling with in games, and and it's been a a lifelong uh, pursuit since then. So, um, awesome. Current day, uh, started up a, a gym in Milwaukee called the Pro Lane. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a 6,000 square foot facility that focuses on just skill development year round. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's a, uh, I always tell people it's like our laboratory, right? We get, <laughs> we get to tinker with ideas and, you know, we don't ever have to look over our shoulder. And, uh, you know, we're, we're fortunate enough to, to have a, a decent client base that believes in us and trusts in us and, you know, we try to co-create environments that uh, actually transfer to games and you get the return on investment. Yeah. No, I think that's a great analogy, Drew. I think good coaches are good experimenters, right? In yeah. every sense of the word, not just yeah. trying stuff, but also observing how, what you do, how, what effect it has and changing and doing something new. Like, um, So I think a lab is a great analogy for what, what practice environment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One of my mentors a long time ago said, you know, if you don't look back every year and you're like, ah, what was I doing that for? Mm-hmm. It's probably time to to retire, right? Mm-hmm. So it's that constant, you know, evolution, uh, adapting, aligning with the current research because, you know, the game changes year to year. Uh, so much of this stuff is it's, it's a brand new landscape and it's just being open to try things and understanding that not everything's going to work. Right. And just to take notes and then to continually just pivot. Right. It's validated learning as we're going through all this. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I was interested, you know, I, you, you said you went to China. Did you notice, were there big kind of cultural differences, you notice right away in, in like how people practice and, and oh, that yeah. was that eye opener? It, it was, I, I always tell people like first, first two weeks you're, you're sitting and you go to practice, you come home, you're like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> And, uh, you know, it, it wears off eventually, but yeah, you start to see just, just the differences. And I think one of the major things I took away from China was, you know, the intent was there to get better, right? The mm-hmm. intent was they're searching for a competitive edge. It was just done in a way that they thought more is better, mm-hmm. right? More volume. If we work more, we're going to be better. And when in reality, that's, that's not how it works. Um, so that was a big, a big thing that you, you have to deal with. Right. And I was at, junior level i was at the top men's league level and you still saw it and you battled it daily um and and i found as i got a couple years under my belt there it it was a lot easier to just focus on the smaller sessions i might have three or four guys ask me to come practice you know come get some work in before practice after practice maybe on an off day and that's where you could really start to uh change the environment a bit 
And, and I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I just mm-hmm. knew that some, there was a disconnect somewhere and I was just searching, you know, for, for ways to maybe bridge that gap. Yeah. No, I think that that's a great point, Drew. I think like, especially in your sport, basketball, everyone has the whoever, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, whoever that, the, one of the reasons they were so good is they put hours and hours of reps yeah. and they were the first one there, the last one to leave. So we, we yep. do have the kind of this impression of just more is going to get you there. Um, and mm-hmm. I see it in my sport too, like the, you know, the number of swings people take in <laughs> is, yeah. but you know, how, so how do you kind of, how did you kind of reconcile that? How do you deal with that with people that just kind of have that attitude of more, more and more jump shots? Right? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It's man, it's a constant, constant thing we're up against. Um, you know, and it's not really like, it's not the player's faults to be mm. honest, because that's all they know. You don't know what you don't know. Right. Mm. So they, they come up from an area where, you know, you're doing everything on air, you're making moves at a cone and, and that's just what they know. That's what they're comfortable with. So I totally get that. We try to respect that. Um, you know, but the same token, it's like, we're trying to say, Hey, okay, instead of shooting 10 shots at this spot, right. Like change your footwork, every other rep, maybe change the distance you shoot it from, like try to do something a little bit differently, right? Just add a little bit of variability and you'll see a bigger return. I promise you. And so that's, that's kind of like the, the olive branch. So we're trying to offer these guys, like, I don't want to reconstruct your whole game day routine, anything like that. Can we just have a five minute segment where we include some decisions and we throw a little variability your way. And if you want to finish spot shooting from a confidence standpoint, as long as you're good with that, I'm fine too. Like it's, I'm not going to totally take over their, their game day routine. Yeah. So I think you've said it before too. It's like, you just got to start to sprinkle some of the stuff in and try it, Mm -hmm. you know, overhauling to go from totally on air to totally reactive and in a chaotic environment. That's a huge change. I totally get that. And I'm okay. Like taking baby steps to try and get them to that. Yeah. No, I think that's really smart. Yeah. You're right. That's exactly you know, that opinion. And you, I think we're all acknowledging like getting like skill acquisition and development is not the purpose of every single drill, right? Doing the same right. shot over and over, making yourself feel good and confident. <laughs> and mm-hmm. that obviously we would say that's probably not, you're not going to improve very much in that drill, but it, that's not yeah. the purpose of it, right? To change right. your technique or anything like that. Yeah. 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 And I think if you can, if you can just have a focus from a coach standpoint of of the intention of the session, right. Is it learning or is it performance, right? Are you day of the game? I'm not going to throw a bunch of stuff at you that you're going to fail. And then you go into the game questioning, right. It's so it's, it's understanding that it's okay to have a performance, uh, minded, you know, session where it's short and it's deliberate that you just, you know, you're building that confidence and that rhythm for these guys. Yeah. I think that that's really important. And I, you know, I don't. We don't have access to Michael Jordan's full practice history, obviously. But I like to believe there's some of that going on, right? That he wasn't yeah. doing every single shot. You know, um, you know, Stephen Curry is like a good. We can see inside the, mm-hmm. a, bit, a bit more, and we see that's certainly not what he's doing when he goes uh, when he's off on his own and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, there's some of that in there. But, um, but yeah. So then I, I guess you know, you know, in talking to you before was was kind of the biggest shortcoming you saw in kind of how you were coached and how people were, was like putting it into the game. Was that kind of the decision-making part, adapting to the, you know, you work so much on shooting technique or whatever it is. Is that kind yeah. of the biggest shortfall that you saw? Yeah, I would say coming up as a player, it was that. And then it was pl- coaches telling me I couldn't take a certain shot. Okay. Or... I couldn't do a certain move. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I was kind of a unique situation. So I, uh, I write right handed, Mm -hmm. but I shoot left handed. Okay. And, you know, I think it was about fifth grade that I I kind of made that shift. I had a hand injury, so I had to learn how to shoot lefty. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I would go back to practice after I healed and my coach would say, okay, do a right hand layup, uh, do a left hand layup. Right. And, and I was able to do both. And then I just started experimenting, jumping off the opposite foot. Right. And he's like, you can't do that. That's not, it's not how a layup's supposed to be done. Right. <laughs> so, and it's like, okay, well, the ball went in. You define it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's results. Right. I made it and I, I did it pretty fluidly. So there's something there. Right. So mm-hmm. that always stuck with me that these coaches would tell me I couldn't do certain things or shoot floaters. And it's like, well, actually, I'm pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. 
And if everyone else is going to the basket, why wouldn't I want to stop a few feet short and play in that pocket of space? Mm -hmm. So those things always stuck with me. And as I got into coaching and transition and obviously reading your first book was kind of the, the big like light for, for me and our organization in which like, okay, there isn't an ideal technique, right? Mm -hmm. You can have these individual uh, motor tendencies and movement patterns. And that actually is what fuels the creativity in this game. Mm -hmm. It's why everyone watches basketball because it's, it's not a, uh, a recital. It's, yeah. it's jazz, right? It's impromptu. It's, it's guys out there making reads and, and, and just, you know, interacting with their environment. So when that's when, when I read the book, I was able to kind of make the connection and Jake and I started, you know, playing around with this and experimenting. That's where we started to see like, like okay, there, there really is something to this, right? And there's different ways to solve the same problem. Mm -hmm. And the more you can encourage athletes give them the freedom to explore that stuff and, and fail and, you know, give positive feedback. Uh, the more players start buying in and the more people wanted to, to join our sessions and they leave happy. They look forward to it. They, they feel like they learn, they feel like they, they evolve their game a little bit and it's been great. You know, it's, it's one of those things that I just, uh, I'll never go back to mm -hmm. how I used to do it five years ago. And so th is that why you kind of, I know you kind of, you in your gym, you work with all different numbers, right? Sometimes you just have one player you're working with. Yeah. Sometimes you have, you know, enough to play three on three or something. Um, so with yep. the one player, are, are you just, is that what you're kind of working on? Kind of adapt, like just throwing different footwork, different ang angles, you and their face, is that kind of what you're focusing on when you're working with one player? Yeah. You know, it's again, it's like trying to throw as much variability as them as possible. Like mm -hmm. a lot of those sessions would be, you know, a, a more of a differential learning type where mm -hmm. it's, it's different positions one after another, we call it like a rhythm breaker mm -hmm. where, you know, maybe it's three different footwork patterns, one after the other and make or miss, you go to the next footwork pattern. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just constant, constantly adjusting and adapting as you're going through the workout. Um, another big thing where, you know, we try to stress is having intern coaches so that if there is only one player, we have a body in front of them or to the side of them closing out, trying to change things, trying to have their eyes up, understanding what they're going to see in a game to then connect to those real in-game results. Okay. So you're giving them lots of problems to solve, right? Yeah. Uh, not instead Absolutely. of this is like you put your hand on this side of the ball yeah. and like shooting the one way. Yeah. Um, what do you right. do? What do you do though? If you, you like, you give them this and there's clearly you see something you don't, is there anything I guess in the shot that you'd see and you don't like, and you want to change about it or just keep giving them more and hopefully they adapt, but, or do you step in if you see something, you know, maybe they're not putting their lower body into it at all or something like that. Yeah. I don't know what they, a good example, but yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, yeah. you know, is there one way to shoot? Absolutely not. Are there, uh, certain like pillars and commonalities between success, sexual mm -hmm. shooters. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like generally what we start with is a feet. So mm -hmm. we try to help them find balance. Right. And they might be 10 toes of the rim. They might be a turn shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter what their base is. We just try to help them find balance consistently, right. Okay. From a stationary place from, you know, a movement in, you know, to the side, and then you start to incorporate like a dribble pickup, right. You might, you might have a curve angle, um, all those little kind of different nuanced ways to get into the shot. Mm -hmm. We just continue to try and give them feedback on find the balance, right. If you can find balance, now you're shooting from a, from a much better standpoint in terms of being able to connect your lower body to your upper body and have more energy go through the ball to the rim. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing that we try to look at. Now, there's a different ways some people hold, you know, hold the ball differently. They might center it on their pointer, they're between the two. We just kind of look at are they getting the results they want? How are they missing? And then we might give some suggestions on, hey, try this. Try shifting over, your, you know, your fingers over just slightly this way. Try to turn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But it's very much like guided towards, okay, how did that feel? Right. Right. And we're, we're fortunate enough, we have the NOAA system, which gives us feedback on if the yeah. ball enters at an arc, mm -hmm. the depth within the rim, and then if it's left or right. So we can kind of, you know, cue the different feedbacks we're listening for mm -hmm. and have that player lock in on that and try to think, okay, if you're missing three to the left, how do we get it to two or a one, right? Mm -hmm. So incremental adjustments, but player led through that exploration. Yeah. No, I really like it. I like the way you put that, Drew. I think... There's some kind of the, I think people have sometimes this misleading 
view of this approach that you always, oh, I can't talk about their body at all. I can't, I always have to come out with yeah. an analogy. Like for me, there's nothing wrong with saying, why don't you try to spread your fingers part further part on the next shot? Like yep. you're just giving them, you're just moving them to a different option, right? Yeah. Yes, it's internal and, <laughs> you know, violates all yeah. these, but I think like kind of giving a suggestion like that, like try it as uh, long as you don't keep hammering it. Like you have to do it that way. But yeah. just giving them an option, especially when you know you as a coach, you can tell, okay, that's most li that's likely going to help, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right. So, so is that and the that way you like, that's the way you think of yeah. it, kind of guiding them, yeah, yeah. And and we've had discussions too where you helped us with that. Where you're like, mm -hmm. you can, it's okay to use some internal because at one point we were trying to be completely external, mm -hmm. and it was it was impossible. Mm -hmm. I was spending more time trying to figure out how to do it externally and cue it externally. And wasting time in the session when a simple, hey, try to try to widen your feet a little bit, and then how does that feel, right? Yeah. How does that feel for you? Yeah. And so I think it's just understanding that it's okay, like you said, to go to that. Um, it's not a requirement that I'm going to say you're doing it wrong, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter. It's it's what are you feeling in that moment? What does it feel to you? Like how would you describe that? And we found some really good answers from players just asking them that, like, what does it feel like when you're balanced? Right. Mm -hmm. And every player has a kind of a different word that they can anchor to that. Yeah. But we found that really accelerates the the process. Yeah. I think that's really key. Drew. I think you're like, you're taking an internal words and make, and then you're putting it external by t getting the focus on how it feels. Like that's yeah. the outcome. That's not the, right. you're getting away from focusing on the actual mechanics. Right. Yep. How, then usually when you ask people how you feel, they usually come out with an external, like some mm -hmm. analogy, or it felt like I was, you know, balanced. Balanced is a great, that's kind of like a holistic. It's yeah. Not, yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think. And, and it's funny because like different players have different definitions of balance. Mm -hmm. And so that's the cool part, like just sitting back and just allowing these players to, to you know, essentially we're co-creating kind of their anchor words. Like they're telling us what they're feeling. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. I'm going to write that down. You know, and that might connect the dots quicker for the next player. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to stay mindful of that and, and allow them to give us ideas too. Because again, at the end of the day, it's just about, can we, can we, you know, speed up the process and cut out, you know, sessions where no growth is happening and, and speed that up. Yeah, no, I agree. Whatever it, if it gets you to the, the yeah, uh, you can say the word banana to yourself. I don't care. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that that's that's really good. I think that's a really good. And then so and then with kind of bit when you have more players and or coaches, you kind of I know you guys use a lot of small sided games and designing different. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of how you think think about that. Yeah, I mean, small sided games. Everyone's using it nowadays, mm -hmm. um, and I think people get caught up on like what is the drill like how are you how are you making it this brand new drill and it doesn't need to be that it's literally you can do the same 3v3 and if you change where the ball's entered or how you start it changes the entire dynamic of the environment mm -hmm. um and so for us it's really just kind of creating these templates playing around with some of the variables like lately we've we got a shot clock, right? So we're playing with a, with a ton of options where the shot clock is essentially the biggest constraint where, you know, you might have five seconds to make a decision. You might have seven, or if we do, you know, where it's back to back reps, we started at 15 and whatever time's left on the clock after the first shot, that's how much time you have for the second rep. Mm -hmm. So cool. incentivizing, mm -hmm. you know, find high value solutions, you know, search for them early and, and kind of essentially take risks and, and, make decisions and then you afford yourself a little bit more time the second rep. So mm -hmm. just playing around with that and taking notes and, and asking players, how do they like it? You know, are they learning? Are they, are they getting something out of it? Mm -hmm. And that, that goes a long ways. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a good way to think of it. And I think like you're, you're right. Like it's nothing new, <laughs> like ecological yeah. dynamics, like small, especially basketball, like a triangle offense is essentially a right. small sided game, right? The, bull, yeah. the bulls <laughs> you use it in the game itself. Right. Um, right. it's like trying to make five on five down <laughs> to lower numbers. Right. So yeah. it's, there's nothing new about it. Right. At all. But yep. it's, you're right. It's about how you use it. You know, how you adapt it to what you see the yep. players doing. And I think you're right. Like almost, almost any kind of, way you want to slice is going to, I think, going to help development. Um, especially yep. if you, you kind of build on it, like you say, based on how, how they're responding. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, to, to add to that as well, um, one of the things I've been conscious of since reading your second book was, you know, uh, affording more opportunities simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's not always just a one on one shooting drill. Mm. Sometimes we'll add in a second player. Now they can pass to that player. Yeah. Now they can go cut. You know, they have that option where they don't have to settle for a really tough shot, which they probably wouldn't do in a game. Mm-hmm. Right. So now they have the option to kick it. They can respace. And then we're kind of building on the shared affordances side of it, where now these two players are trying to interact and perceive the same opportunities while playing with an advantage against one live defender. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, it's like, how do we take that? Cause I'll tell you what, four months ago, I wasn't, you know, we were adding pass out options, but not as prevalently as we are right now, because I understand like it is what these players are interacting with. And mm-hmm. this is more specific to what they're seeing in a game. Yeah. Right. So it's constantly keeping multiple affordances open at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, basketball is the, the skilled intentionality idea is yeah. like, that's really what a really great port, point guard, right, <laughs> is a yep. master of that, right? They keep yep. multiple things open for as long as possible and cr- pick the good one, <laughs> like, and yeah. keep and teams keep moving to create them, and you know, and, and you know, and and waiting almost a lot, letting the defense pick one for you sometimes, or, but also you don't, you can't just do that, like you said in basketball. I think that's why I like the timing. You have to kind yep. of take the quick one sometimes, and you know. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a really good, um, uh, really good. Way. And I, you mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to ask you more about it. The, uh, the, uh, you mentioned kind of using, starting to get some analytics and technology. So that's, mm-hmm. uh, that's a shot tracker, right? You, you, you're using. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's called the Noah and mm-hmm. essentially it's a camera that goes over the top of the rim and it mm-hmm. gives you feedback on every shot, make or miss. Okay. And you can select at all times is tracking three variables, left, right depth within the rim and then the art arc that it enters the rim. So entry okay. angle, um, from audio feedback, you just select one of those. Okay. But at all times is giving data on all three and, and logging it. Um, and, and you can have an individual player logged in where at the end of the workout, they can download exactly how many shots they took, their makes their misses, their average arc, average left, right, average depth within a shot, make mm-hmm. or miss. Um, and then you can also have multiple players on the court at the same time. And just getting that constant audio feedback in sessions. And, and that's something we use a ton. Uh, you know, we'll say, you know, if it's if it's a, if it's a between a, a minus one to a one, so essentially one inch left, one inch right, that's plus one. Okay. Right. So that shot value is now added on because you're shooting it more effectively through the center of the rim. Okay. Um, and, and again, just it's it's just adding more constraints and, and trying to incentivize, you know, finding ways to find balance. Uh, eliminate energy leaks and and play within the game context yeah and so it's giving is it giving like auditory feedback based on the you 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 just pick one of those variables like left right yeah if you miss really far left does it be really loud (laughs) well yeah yeah well the the, yeah the the audio stays the same so the volume stays the same it's just the numbers that increase okay they will yell out at yeah okay um and it's it's really cool we've had it for about a year and a half now and players love it yeah um it's it's just, again it's just another way to engage and, and bring out competitive you know nature of these players whether it's an on-air shooting workout with three players and we're just kind of doing those rhythm breaker style mm-hmm. or it's live one-on-one and you're getting rewarded for you know shooting uh more accurate shots yeah yeah no i this is something you know i kind of I think I've changed my tune on a little bit over the, you know, the, and there's this classic motor learning effect, right? Where you're not supposed to give too much external feedback like that, mm-hmm. right? Well, you basically, you want people to learn to judge on their own, whether the shot was good or not, right? You don't want a machine yeah. telling you. Right. Um, you, so, but which I'm sure you, you don't want to do it always, which I'm sure you don't. Yeah. Do, right. <laughs> um, yeah. But at the same time you see, you know, the more and more I kind of get into that, there's, there's some practice environments where, it's the, I think the, the feedback is not the best always, right? Like uh, it's the natural feedback you get is, is, is not going to give you, you know, that enough to kind of really fine tune your shot. And so mm-hmm. enhancing it, I think sometimes it can be really useful. 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, it's, it's much like small sided games, right? Mm-hmm. Small sided games essentially just amplify information that you mm-hmm. wouldn't necessarily pick up mm-hmm. all that often and on a more continuous basis. Yeah. Uh, so same thing with the shooting, you know, and that's the great thing about it. Like we can have a player shooting on it and it might be one on all, but they're listening to the numbers and they're just trying to adjust. They know mm-hmm. four means four, right. And the goal is maybe to be two, one or zero. Right. Mm-hmm. So that they, they can start to play around with adjustments. And then again, locking in on what did that feel like? Right? Yeah. It's their process. They're kind of owning it. And we're just there kind of guiding them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the I've been saying that, you know, the experiencing that there's some new thing you're trying actually makes something good happen, like a good outcome is the most yeah. powerful yep. thing we can rather than you telling them try yeah. this right a coach telling them yeah that, that that's something but actually experiencing that it makes your shot go more in the middle of the rim and is is way Absolutely. more powerful right yeah um but yeah have you also i think we talked before once you know there's kind of this uh have you been able to find kind of what kind of parameters work best for individual like i know there's a big thing in basketball about how much arc you you put on your shot right as steep as possible i think used to be a kind of and i think you find it that's not kind of true for everybody is it yeah Yeah, it varies to be honest we have shooters that shoot at a very consistent rate that come in at 52 Mm -hmm. we have some shooters that are at 46 Mm -hmm. and, and everything in between and i think it's just more so watching how those players you know, are shooting, you know, watching the mechanics, uh, what are the, what are the rates of, of their makes from three spot up off the dribble and seeing like, yeah, okay, this player's probably suited to shoot a little bit higher, right? Yeah. Um, this player needs to be a little bit lower. So it, it's, again, it's case by case. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think there's, you can put players in a box, say, yeah, 45, 46 is the, is the perfect uh, height for them. Mm-hmm. I've seen it all across the board and, and they're very consistent shooters. So there is some indiv- individuality to it. And, yeah. um, you know, and I think it just goes along with, there's not one way to do it. Yeah. Um, it's just results oriented. So if you're making shots and it looks good and you can, you know, get to it in game versus pressure, mm-hmm. I'd say, how do we support you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a great way to look at it too. And the way I think it, you know, is not saying, okay, you have to move, change this way like you have to put more arc yeah. on your shot but also i think getting them to try that and it, mm-hmm. having that as a possible solution is yeah. beneficial like if there's a, someone in their face all right, right? Um, yep. not forcing them to change but getting them to experience okay let's get it try to get it in the basket with a really high arcing um, yeah i think letting them explore that part of this movement solution space even if they yep. never go back there, <laughs> I think right, it's, I exactly, think it's yeah. useful. Yeah. 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 Cause we'll do, we'll do like differential learning, mm-hmm. um, shooting sessions where we we'll say, okay, you got to make two at 50 and higher. You got to make two oh, okay. from 48 to 50. And then you got to make three from 47 to 45. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and players, they do figure it out and it's, they may never go back to that, but mm-hmm. it is, you can see them kind of working through some stuff and it's, it's very interesting to see the differences in the makes when they kind of toggle between those three ranges. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, oh, that's really cool. And I, I like that focusing kind of on the, po- the perform the outcome uh, yeah. based of it, rather than just oh, shoot a shot with one hand that that's useful too, but or right. feet wide apart. But I think also yep. varying the outcomes. Uh, yeah. It's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I really like how you, you kind of work that in. I think, I think that's, where are we really missing that's i think that's where we can really make a lot of headway with it the analytics and the, is in the practice mm-hmm. for practice design not just yeah. game <laughs> you know perform it's useful for that obviously but right uh, putting it back into practice and in, and using as a tool mm-hmm. right and yeah. you know and a lot of people are going to say well we don't have access to a noah it's mm-hmm. like okay i get that so one of the things we do is we do a, a four shot series at the free throw line. We say, you got to make one where you hit the front rim and in, mm-hmm. you got to hit back rim and in bank and then a swish, mm-hmm. right? So you can toggle between those types of makes mm-hmm. as well in a shooting workout. And it changes it dramatically. I mean, toughest one is the front rim yeah, and in. I bet, and the yeah. player's like, how the heck do I do this? And it's like soon enough, they figure it out though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. This is kind of the, some of the stuff I've, I've been, playing with and I was talking about on this week's podcast about 
trying to get people to do things you probably wouldn't actually want them to do, right? Yeah. right? You don't ever want a player to deliberately bank a three pro free throw off the backboard. Right. Right? First of all, people would probably laugh at you if you, right? you'd be embarrassed, <laughs> but, but the actual learn, you're right, figuring out how to do that is very, yeah. very it, it, it contributes to the, for you learning how to get it swish every time, right? It's just yeah. a different problem, yeah. No, yep. I, I really like. Um, so, do you think you, know, you the the players have kind of has 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 it been a bit of adjustment for this kind of coaching? Um, not, you know, I'm sure I, from you know talking to you, you're, you're not jumping in all the time and telling them what to do. You figure out you figure out how to make the ball go yeah. out the front rim. Um, has it been a bit of an adjustment for for some players to to be coached that way? Yeah, I would say you know initially it was much different and now we have a pretty, pretty core client base that they, they love it. Like mm -hmm. they come in, they know exactly what to expect, but yeah, you can always see a first time uh, client coming in, you know, trying to work out. You definitely see like the eyes are wide open. Parents are like, what the, you know, what, what's going on here? And it's, but again, it's just allowing them to be okay with that and to have fun and mm -hmm. to embrace it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it's not for everybody. We we definitely have some people that they just can't, you know, it just doesn't vibe with them. And we're good with that. Mm -hmm. And part of like, as I get into this business is understanding that no's are just as powerful as yeses, mm -hmm. because the more no's we get, the more we kind of lock in on the people that want to buy in on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just makes for a better coaching environment, better learning environment and overall experience. Yeah. No, that that's really good. That's uh, I think that's a good way to think of it. And um, yeah, I, I would say I get the same too <laughs> with people. Yeah. When are you going to start coaching? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have no uh, idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of to, to end off, what would you, you know, kind of give a, you know, people advice about how to kind of move in this direction? Um, you know, with, you know, maybe someone that's, you know, doing more fundamentals, skill and drill kind of to, to doing more. Of, of kind of a, this, this approach, do you have any advice for people to kind of get, get going? For, for us, it was easiest just to kind of, to start by playing more live games, right? Mm -hmm. One on one, one on two, two on two, mm -hmm. sit back and just watch. And the one thing that I always took away with was the engagement level. Mm -hmm. The athletes were completely engaged and, and you saw like just all these different creative solutions come out and you're like, there's something to this. And then the next phase would be trying to deconstruct that a little bit, right. Mm -hmm. And put it into a situation where, okay, if you only had one athlete, how could you replicate what you're seeing there mm -hmm. with a guide, with a guided defender? Maybe it's just you, uh, you know, find ways to, to incorporate that where they're engaging with some kind of information. Mm -hmm. and, and then the rest, like it, it's easy. Once you start playing around with that, you'll start to get ideas. You'll start to see, and, and again, talk to your players. Mm -hmm. I think they'll let you know, like, Hey, I really, I really like this, this drill or this, mm -hmm. whatever we just did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why? What, like, what did you like about it? Right. And, and they'll tell you everything you need to know. And then from there, it just becomes just keep experimenting. But to think that you have to go from a to B overnight, it's never going to happen. And that's daunting for sure. Mm -hmm. Start small, take notes, and just continue to sprinkle it in and layer it in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really like that. I, this is something, you know, talking to all the coaches I have through this kind of series, the observation part of it is so, yeah. It, we kind of underestimate that. Like, I, I think yep. we're, well, we don't, we in coaching, it's always been important, but it's more seeing what you want to see, like in terms mm -hmm. of technique, that's the way we're taught to kind of yeah. observe versus being more open and yeah. what is it about this drill that makes players so engaged, right? Um, right. Instead of looking for the the thing you want to see, kind of being more open to seeing other things, <laughs> which is yeah. hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's that's great advice. You're right. Not you know, just that's what I always say to people: to take your favorite drill and let's throw some variability in it, or <laughs> a, yeah. you know, what just Simple. kind of play around with it. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. But. Um, but yeah, no, that's this. Uh, I really uh, thanks for for joining me with this, Drew. I really appreciate uh, you telling us about how. And anyone in Milwaukee, <laughs> I encourage you to look you up, yeah. um, or in the area, or can travel yeah. there anyway. So, I think yeah, like I said, I think you got a good mix of 
the all the parts of like you said with the technology with the you know all the um that for a good skill development yeah i appreciate that rob you yeah. know it's you, you've been a big part of it the last two years and uh you know I just want to continue to build it in a way that i think uh the modern game needs to be played and mm-hmm. you know just allowing more players to to have creative solutions i think is is the biggest part of all this so appreciate all your help as always oh my pleasure so thanks for joining me okay that's it for today's episode remember you can contact me at rob gray at asu.edu or follow me on twitter at shaky weights to find out more about the podcast please check out perceptionaction.com finally to support the podcast and receive bonus materials including two monthly coaches meetups please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action this is rob gray from asu cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone straight away.